Welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Join us here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first. Teresa Merritt Watson is a woman who gives back as a community leader and as owner of a company that advocates for African-American students, providing resources and helping them apply for scholarships. She also works with a company called Three Ps to help engage parents and students on passion, pursuit, and purpose. And she's written a book that fills a major void in American history that ties in with everything she does. It is entitled Black Tech, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, Leaders in Technology. I have always worked with children, and I have a, a particular interest in not seeing people fail, and that's really important to me. And I think that everybody has something to bring to the table. So when I start looking at reading a lot of the profiles on African Americans, it was concerning me because there's such great qualities in African-Americans, but people never get to see it because they see this thing where you go to school and they're not passing the the EOCs or the EOGs or the integrate tests, basically. They're not being successful in their grade. Now, there's a problem with that. And so one of the things that I said is what is going on in school? Because there was a point that we, um, African-Americans, they were taking leader roles in the integrate test. But you don't see that in you you rarely see that anymore. And so what happened to us doing well in school? Well, one of the things that dawned on me is a lot of the African Americans don't know their history. They don't know the contribution that African Americans have made in the development of this country. And so when you enter into a classroom and you don't see yourself, you're just going through the motion of going to school. And by the time the kid gets in third, fourth grade, they're sort of done. They, they've just basically written themselves off. It's like I have six children. And if I sit at the table with my six kids and I ostracize one of them like they don't really have any value, they just here to eat dinner and that's it. Uh, they hear just to be able to spill some words into your learning process, that's a problem. And so I said, okay, how can I help? And so I started out writing a book at the sixth or seventh grade level. But then it dawned on me that a lot of times people are not going to pick them up and read them because it's a lot It's a lot to say. So I, what I tried to do is between first and third grade, and sometime four, write a book that you can look like a tabletop, you pick it up and you learn at least one thing. So most of the people that have gotten my book, they they learned that Gladys West created the GPS. She was instrumental in the creation of GPS. That is something that cars have in their system. If you have a, G, a cell phone, you have a GPS on your phone. Right. That's a major instrument that's created by a black person. A lot of different technology. And I did technology first because that's something that the children can relate to. I'm trying to show you that if you educate your children before they leave home about the great things that African Americans have done to help develop this country as we know it today, then your kid will take a different position on learning. And then it will impact other ethnic groups that sometimes look at us as we have no value in education or we don't know, but we're a vital part of this development. And I just think people of all races need to know it, but more importantly, African Americans need to know it. Absolutely. And I, I think the uh, the movie Hidden Figures did that. Yes. But what I what I want to say to you is that I need black people to know about themselves, but I also need other people to know the contribution for African American as well. So I don't necessarily do all all black people like right now i'm going to texas for a week and i think i got a tv and a radio show out there and i did 
this place called Slumo Slime in Atlanta. They asked me to do the Black History for for Slumo Slime, and I did that. And they they see seventy thousand children a week, and I was there for three days. I did a book lecture and a book tour. And how did it go? It went well. The classroom that they provided me, a lot of times the classroom was full. And were people like, I didn't know that. Actually, people were like, where did you get this information? I didn't know that. I put the reference in the back. But people were stunned. And, you know, I I had diverse population in there, so they were really stunned. But the saddest thing is you, you see these black people and they knew nobody, you know. Every session I go to, people walk up to me. I read your book. I did not know this information. I am 70 years old, and I didn't know any of this. I, I, I didn't know most of this. They didn't know about Alexandria Miles. That's, that's one of my favorite, by the way, Alexandria Miles, because created the ele- automatic elevator door opener. And before, there used to be a lady, most of the time a lady, that were, when you get on the elevator, they will open and close the elevator door. But it wouldn't do it automatically. Alexander Mao created where it closes automatically what we have to this day. That's what he created. When I explained that to him, people said, well, he didn't create the elevator door. He did not create the elevator door, but he created an automatic elevator door opener as we know today. You know, Mary Jackson, so she was a mathematician. She's one of the ones that was at the uh, Hidden Figures the mathematician, and people who said, how do I get my kids to, to be more engaged in math? I said, well, you can turn things that you do when they're helping you with your app, with your, um, in the kitchen, or they're helping around the house, turn everything into a math issue. I have an apple slicer. It has six things in it. I want three apples. I want 18 slices, because you already know three times six is 18. And so that person got to count the number of apples. So you start at the at the lower grades, at the lower level, and it gradually increase. And so you can estimate, you can do all these things. She, she happened to be a genius by the time she was uh, five in math. And then you got Frederick Jones. He created the refrigerator truck. And he did that out of necessity. And that's what I wanted to be able to bring to the kids, that these things are done out of necessity. Sometimes you, you have a situation where he his job was to take the medicine from hospital to hospital. But by the time he got to a hospital, uh, uh, hospital sometimes in his, particular in the summertime, it was after the medicine was no, was no longer any good because it had been ruined. And so that's prompted him to create the refrigerator truck. The other thing I create is a sense of pride because every if you notice, all the people have a title. You let them know whether they went to a HBCU, historically black college, because, you know, some people say, well, I don't want to go to no school that's all black, but they'll go to a school that's predominantly white, but they don't want to go to a school that's all black. Well, I have to show the great things that come out of those HBCUs. And then I also show that you don't have to go to college to be successful or to be a be a creator. Alexandra Miles or Frederick Jones, they didn't go to college. They are self-taught engineers. So you have to appreciate the different things. And even down to our security system, Miriam Van Britton Brown, she created a security system that all of us use today. When you think of your security system, you don't think about nobody black because they don't, the image that this painted for black people is not there. And all I'm saying is that God created us all. And there's not one working, walk, walking on the planet that's better than the other. You need to have an appreciation. But in order for people to appreciate you as black people, you need to appreciate yourself. You need to understand what your contribution is. And that's why, that's why I wrote the book. Well, I certainly learned a lot today, Teresa. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. James C. Vincent is a retired art teacher who continues to paint, draw, and write children's books, including the book we're talking about today entitled The Awesome Pet Giraffe. Now, you have written four children's books. That's correct. You did your homework. I uh, started in 2014, and since then I've done four books. My latest is The Awesome Pet Giraffe. So what inspires you? Well, I guess in a word, grandchildren. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that'll do it. Yes. Um, all of my books are about my grandchildren. And uh, 
Here's the distinction between my books and most other children's books, because I've read as a teacher, I've had that opportunity to read books to children, including my own children. But the distinction is my my book has very realistic paintings in it. OK, super realistic. And the story is something feasible, something that could happen, you know, based on fact, in other words. And and it has a moral to it. So, you know, there's a lot of books out there that are excellent children's books, you know, but most of them are based on fantasy, which is fine. But in my books, I try to get the reader and the listener to relate to real things that could happen in your life and make them appreciate some of those things and enjoy them. It's called being relatable. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Most of your main characters are, for the most part, are Rita and Bubby, right? Yes, except in this last book, The Awesome Pet Giraffe, see, they're like sequels. Rita and Bubby are all grown up, and they only, they appear in it as, they make a cameo appearance. How's that? <laughs> it's not really about them, but they're in it. I had to include them, you know. So, so what real-life situation is this one based on? Well, it's about a little girl who goes to the famous Naples Zoo in Florida, and has a wonderful time seeing all the animals and everything like that. But there's one animal in particular that she really is drawn to, and it's the giraffe. And a little while after she's gone to the zoo, she decides it might be a good idea to have one as a pet. So that's kind of the premise of the story. How can she achieve a pet giraffe? I'm just going to throw this out there, but how many people have a pet giraffe? I don't think you can have one. I think you, I think you have to have special zoning for a pet giraffe, <laughs> right? Well, now, yeah, isn't that the truth? So that makes the story even more interesting because you and I both know that you, you probably cannot own a pet giraffe. Does she beg? Does she scream? Does she jump up and down? What does she do? <laughs> well, she tries different sources. She tries her... She's thinking her grandpa once said to her that he would get her anything. And she goes to her father and she tells her cousins and everybody tries to make her realize she doesn't get upset. She gets disappointed, but everybody tries to make her realize that you just, that's just one animal you can't own as a pet, you know? And I, and I also want to add, because the story has, the story has a moral to it. If you can get past page nine, Without laughing, I will not write another book because I think it's really fun. <laughs> you said it, I didn't, James. <laughs> yeah. All right. You probably hold me to it, right? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I am. I'm holding you to it. Mm -hmm. um, can you share the moral of the story? Uh, yes, I can. The moral of the story is sometimes when you want something that you can't have, you have to look at your life and realize that there's a lot of people in your life that really care about you and love you and will try to make you happy in spite of that. But she still doesn't get the giraffe, does she? I'm not <laughs> telling you. <laughs> All right. All right. That's why you have to read it. Now, you're a teacher. You've read to children. You have a leg up on so many other people that I interview who have never written a book, you know, who write children's books. They, they don't know the first thing about how to get it in front of children. You know, mm -hmm. you are in a very fortunate position because I'm assuming that you have read your other children's books to kids how, mm -hmm. how do you how do you organize that? How do you put that together? You just call places you used to work? Well, you know, in the community I live, a lot of people know me because I was a teacher and I've had opportunities. I even did a signing at uh, Barnes and Noble in Hamburg, New York. And I've done a lot of readings at schools, libraries, things of that nature. You know, people have been really supportive, I feel, in the community. The local bookstore carries it. One of the neat experiences about this book is not only reading it to other children, but how many grandchildren get a, read, get a book read to them by the author, the illustrator, and happen to be in it, too. You know, so it's, it's really a, it's kind of a, well, it is definitely a legacy, you know that they'll always have long after I'm gone. Very nice. So you've written four books. Uh, any advice for aspiring writers? Well, you know, it all came, it takes me about a year to do these books. And what I found for myself is if I have a story in mind, the first thing you need to do is write the story. You know, even if it's just notes, write it down. And then like, you know, I always was fascinated with literature and writing 
uh, I became an art teacher because that's where my talents were, you know, but that's not to say I didn't enjoy writing and, and English classes and literature classes of that nature, write something down. And if you don't, if you feel like you need help organizing it, you just go to somebody who doesn't necessarily have to be a writer, but maybe a teacher, you know, a professor or an English teacher, somebody like that. Once you get the story written down, uh, then you can go to somebody, you can go to a place like Fulton Books and you, they have illustrators and they can illustrate it for you, you know, or you can hire somebody independently to, to illustrate it. Fortunately, I was able to do both, but I'm not going to lie to you. I did go to somebody, uh, who was a ex colleague, English teacher. And we spent a couple hours after I had the manuscript down, we spent a couple hours, you know, organizing it and making all the corrections, dotting the I's and crossing the T's, so to speak. And so, you know, that's what made it, made me feel a lot more uh, confident in the final product. So now what? There's no way you're done. No, but I'm never done. You know, it, Alice, I'm going to be 72 years old and, uh, there's so much I want to do. There's so much I want to paint and draw. And uh, there's just so many ideas in my head that, you know, I have to spend five to six days a week, a couple hours a day in my studio, just painting and drawing just to get as much done as I possibly can, because I have a lot of ideas. Will I do another book? Who knows? I didn't think I'd do a fourth book, but now my wife's on me because we have a you know, sixth grandchild that was born three, four months ago. And so, you know, she's on me to do another book. So who knows? I might do another one. I'd like to, you know, see how this book does, push it a little bit and see how it does and tell all the listeners out there that you won't be disappointed. It's not, I remember a lot of books I read as a, you know, when my kids were a child or children, that this book is uh, just long enough because some books are, in my opinion, are way too long. This book has 10 pages of literature, 10 pages of uh, realistic illustrations, and it's just long enough to get the job done, entertain the reader. You know what I'm saying? Right. Is it long enough to get them to sleep, James? That's all That's all the parents want to know. Well, you know, depending on the situation, you might have to read a little slower than usual. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Sometimes James. Sometimes I found myself falling asleep, you know, reading other books before they did. And then it's like, oh, my gosh. When's it I can end? relate. You know? Yeah. All but that's, right, why, that's why I made it uh, a shorter book. And, uh, you know, it, it works because I've experimented with my own grandchildren and other kids and they love the story. They really do. Okay. Fair and enough. I think, the, I think, yeah, I think the, the, the readers would enjoy it too. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you for calling. I appreciate it. You got it. Our next book is entitled T-Rex's Animal Hospital, written by Brayson Lopez. Now, you say you just got up one day and decided you were going to write a book that would include two things you love, time spent reading with your kids and dinosaurs. Is that right? Pretty much. I mean, I have I guess I've always not minded writing in college and high school, but I always kind of wanted to write a children's book, so... That's what I did. Why did you want to write a children's book? I think it's due to all the years that I've read to my kids. You know, that was the night routine. Every night I would read them a book. That was kind of a bonding kind of uh, fun tradition. You know, it was it was interactive and kind of kind of opened up the, the dialogue for, you know, what they, you know, their day, what they did that day. You know, anything they wanted to tell me. It was just kind of a nice little time of the you know, day with them. How old are they now? Oh, gosh, they're 24 and 21. And now you write a children's book? Yes, yes, yes. Now I do, yes. <laughs> Why now? I don't know. It, it just kind of came to me. It took, you know, I've been kind of piddling with the idea, and then finally it just kind of came to me what I wanted to write. T-Rex's Animal Hospital. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, where'd you come up with that? not really sure i mean it, um, my background is well i know where i came from my background i'm i'm spanish um uh, so i was trying to come up with a name that was a, with a spanish uh, background so thomas and then the rexo was the spanish background but you know I, i'm a big fan of dinosaurs so that's t rex is what what i was going for when you were a little kid did you like playing with dinosaurs 
Oh yeah, I loved reading about dinosaurs, looking at books, reading books. Uh, I still love dinosaurs. I, I love all the Jurassic Park movies, you know, Jurassic World. Uh, yeah, I love dinosaurs. Did Did your kids watch Land Before Time? Yes, they did. I watched that with them too. Did you love that? I loved that. <laughs> yes. I, that was one yes, of my I favorites <laughs> over and over and over again. I thought that was just the sweetest story. <laughs> I think yes, there's a I bunch did. of stories. There are. There's several of them. Yeah. Now there's your story. So how's <laughs> what's what's your story? T Rex is the main character. He's an eight year old boy that he helps kind of the kids and family in the neighborhood. He, you know that he they bring their what they are really is their stuffed animals, but to them it, they're as real as the real thing. So yeah, they could bring their you know stuffed animals to them that are injured or hurt or you know ill or sick and. He helps them try to get, try to get, try to heal them and give them solutions to to help their 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 stuffed animals. Is what the what it revolves around. What kinds of injuries does he have to deal with? The first one is a lion that has lost its roar, and so he he uh, kind of takes a look at the lion, looks all over, looks in his mouth, assuming that's where it's coming from, and you know, eventually he comes to the, the, talking to. Jonathan, the lion's owner, to you know, tells him that he does have kind of a kink in his tail. So he looks at his tail, and sure enough, it's got a little kink in it. And he strains it out, and sure enough, the the lion finds his roar again. Um, and then the other one is a is a Appaloosa horse that uh, is afraid to get in its trailer. And so after some some research and talking to talking to its owner, she, he comes to the conclusion that really. The, the horse is just kind of alone and scared to get in the trailer by itself. So he gets, he kind of gets Jonathan's lion to, to go into the trailer and kind of, kind of be its, be its partner in the, in the trailer. So she's more comfortable in the, in the trailer with somebody in there with her. That she's not alone is what it comes down to. So there's a little lesson attached with every. Yeah, animal. there's a little less. Yeah, there's a little lesson attached, and then plus you learn a little bit about the animals. You know, the lion, you learn that their vocal cords are shaped differently than humans, and then the Appaloosa, you you learn that their eyes are not like most horse horses. They have the, their eyes show the actual white, and where most horses' the eyes, you just see the dark um, pupil, and that's it. Um, the hers, you see the white, and then the and then the color of the, the iris, basically. I, I didn't know that. I didn't. I didn't know that either. So until you, you I started writing this book. <laughs> you started doing some research, huh? Yes. 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 What else did you yeah. find out? Um, Appaloosas are the state horse of Idaho. Oh. Uh, so <laughs> I didn't know that either. Okay. What else? Um, that's about it for those. You know, the, the, it's just two animals. So you know, there's going to be more books. I'm, I'm oh, T. Rex only deals with two animals in this book. It's, in this book, there's just two animals. Yeah. Well, it looks so, like there's a dog on the front. Isn't that a dog? Yes, that's that's his dog. That's his pet. That's oh, that's his dog. Pet, Allie, which is named after Allosaurus, the dinosaur. <laughs> He's real, right? He's not stuffed. Yes, the dog is real. Yeah, that's his oh. real dog. <laughs> so, what did your kids say when you said, "Hey, I wrote this book that I"? <laughs> they were they were first kind of skeptical, but they read it and they really liked it. So they all they really all enjoyed it. All right, and now what? I'm telling people about it. Um, my mom's telling everybody about it, so I think she's my biggest um, marketing. She's your marketing um, director. Uh, marketing. <laughs> she's your marketing director. Yes, she's telling everybody, all her friends, and anybody to listen to her. Really. Um, um, I'm starting work. I started working on the second book. Um, I haven't gotten that far into it. Just kind of writing some notes down and stuff like that. But starting on the second yeah. book. How long did this take you to write it once you decided to do it? Uh, it took me about three months to write it. And then it took about, uh, I hired someone to do the illustrations and that took another six months. Takes a while, right? Yeah. Got to be patient. It took a while. Yeah, the, overall, I mean, from the time I started writing to the time it was published, it was it was about a year and a half. Yeah, so now the key is to get it to kids. Next, the next uh, goal, yes. I think your kids need to have kids, and then <laughs> no, not yet. Then you'll have access to kids. <laughs> not, yeah. not yet. No, they're no, they're too young. Well, maybe too you young. can, you know, <laughs> hold it for a while. <laughs> uh, really, I just want kids to enjoy it. I mean, 
you know, kids enjoy it. I want parents to read it to their kids, and, you know, and, and enjoy that time. Really, I don't. I, that's that was really the main goal. Is just to write something that parents would enjoy sharing with their kids, and the kids would in turn like sharing it with their parents. Really, that is very sweet. Well, you know what? I wish you the best of luck. Well, thank you. And thanks so much for talking to me today, Bryson. No problem. I appreciate it. Your time. Let's go to Bermuda, where we find E.T. McLean, author of Esoterica Unveiled, a Compendium of Light. But uh, you're no stranger to New Jersey, are you, right? Where you studied engineering? So look, Alice, I'm very familiar with uh, all things New Jersey, including the eighth wonder of the world, the uh, Turnpike. <laughs> Route 22. Okay. I can tell you where every pothole is over there. As a matter of fact, I was just in New Jersey about three weeks ago, and I spoke at um, a funeral. Believe it or not. Um, so, you know, I've, I've never lost touch uh, back and forth. I worked in New York for significant years also. So you're an engineer by trade. When did you start writing? Technically, since about the age of six. But professionally, you know, I've written here and there. I've spoken at uh, colleges and universities on different subjects, so from architecture um, to philosophy and everything in between, boating, <laughs> uh, navigation, and, and all of these, uh, all of these things. But um, this is my first published uh, work. And what took you so long, sir? Life, Alice. Yeah. I get it. I get it. It shows you things at different times, right? And there comes a time when you know you have to take action and you just can't um, store everything until you die because then you know what's going to happen to it. It serves no purpose. Right. So what inspired Esoterica Unveiled? Well, I'm a grandfather. I have four grandchildren. My 16-year-old granddaughter, um, she really had a lot to do with me saying, let's get serious about this like I wasn't before, um, but the world's going sideways right now. And let's say there are people in the world who have certain gifts, and if we don't use those gifts, we're going to regret it. I don't care what we believe religiously, um, but there will be many regrets, and I decided I don't want to live a life of regret saying I should have, and perhaps that could have um, helped a few people. It sounds like it's a collection of short stories, poetry. That's correct. Most of my writing is inspired by what I've observed and experienced in life, right? Even right up to the present day. Short stories, poems, if you will. It's a collection. It's like they've been curated and picked from many uh, to formulate, say, Esoterica Unveiled, which is the first of three compendiums that I have in store at this point. This is a compendium of light. Yes, and we have one that follows and one that follows after that in the first series, if you will. There are three books. This is the first of three. Um, if I said I was divinely inspired, I know it sounds kind of lofty, but you know what? I think that that's what it is. Most of my writing is one take. I do have people that prove it. But it's hardly, um, I, I don't go back and correct myself and second guess. I leave that to others. Is there a common theme throughout this book? A very common theme is establishing or recognizing one's uniqueness in order to understand why you're on a certain path. Okay. Can you share one of your short stories with me? Okay. One, one of the short stories about the travels of a young man. He traveled over Hill and Dale to find a special place that was chosen before he was born by his ancestors. And that special place took him up to a mount where he created a fire, a fire. And it was a special fire. He didn't know how long he was going to stay there, but after he finished meditating, he placed a sack that he had been carrying on his back for days on end without food or water. He committed this, the contents of this sack to the heavens, if you will. And it was a, it was a sacrifice. Uh, long and short, as the, the contents burned and were offered up to the gods and the ancestors, he danced through the night. He cried. 
he moaned. And um, I would say that with a certain understanding that he had to do what he had to do in order for his tribe to perpetuate itself. And, and you know, they would eat, uh, the crops would grow. Um, but I'm going to jump right to what it was. Um, he was carrying his, his son, and his son was stillborn, was a baby. And he had to uh, basically offer it to the ancestors. And the story has deep meaning when you read it. Um, and it's not a long story. They're, they're very short stories, but they are very significant stories. And you want us to think about where we are, what our purpose is. Yes. He, he basically, in starting out, did not quite understand the purpose of what he was doing. He had an idea. But that idea, as the flames and ashes rose up through the night, and as the eagle saw him the next day, and as he dried his tears, you know, it's a big interplay of nature and this man who would be chief of his village once he returned, um, having to offer his um, son who would follow him. Um, you know, the idea of you're doing this for your people, but yet, you followed your father, but you will have no one following yourself. Um, all of these things play into this one parable. Uh, so it's purpose-driven, but there's an irony in it, and the irony is both happy and sad. It's, uh, it, it's definitely purpose-driven. Do you have a place where you can read what you've written? You have a beautiful voice. You, I mean, like an open mic night. Yes, we have something here. Uh, called Pecha Kucha, and that is like uh, what you're talking about. Yes, it, we do have uh, open mic nights in the summer. I'm going to be promoting my book in Bermuda in those venues. Um, we do have we do have two book clubs um, that are very interested. I'm also a member of a social club that is uh, also going to be hosting like a, a reading night. And I've been asked to um, speak at that also. But overseas, because Bermuda is a small and, and it's sort of like the center of the world to a lot of people, when I do get off the island, I will be promoting. Okay. Well, it sounds like you're on your way. You don't, it really does. It sounds like already you're laying some very fertile groundwork here. I, yes. So, and then let's say in May, I'm off to Washington, D.C. and Annapolis. They're side by side. I'll be there for four days and I will be promoting the book over there also. I have a restaurant date and then another one at Annapolis at Academy. Great. The Naval Academy. I'm looking forward to that. All right. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Quickly, before we uh, have to wrap this up, any advice for aspiring authors? Sure. You want to allow yourself as a writer, author, to experience the journey, right? And my advice, personal advice, would be write without fear of being judged. And that's about the most profound statement I can make to inspire people that are writing. Um, you know, we write for different reasons. But, you know, if your reasons are for mine would be for uh, humanity, service and, and um, transformation, others may have different reasons. Um, the financial part, yeah, it's all good because people will benefit. But the real deal is facing your fear and fear of being judged by others. Fair enough. Good. Good stuff, E.T. McLean. Listen, I'm so glad we hooked up today. Thank you. And thank you. And if you ever decide to uh, be brave enough and come back to this island, um, give me a shout. We'll get you on the water really quick. I'm going to call you and say, I am I am on my way. People know me here. <laughs> thank you. You have a great day. Thank you for your time. Take care. Felisa Seacat Isom has been a massage therapist since 2012. She started out in the Philippines, and then when she came to the U.S., started practicing bamboo therapeutic massage. She found the benefits were so great. It was worth a book of the same name with the subtitle... An easy-to-understand guide for relieving pain, reducing tight muscles, using bamboo self-care, and things to know as a massage therapist. So um, I found out here that bamboo helps the therapist too, right? Yeah. I have a lot of uh, colleagues on the massage industry in two years or three years. If we've done a lot of handwork, 
their hands get tired and they got get hurt and some are surrendering become a massage therapy they look for another job because they feel that their body is also worn out their hand their elbow then i remember way back in the philippines when i study massage there is also a course for bamboo massage and i look back into that and uh, in fact when i came here in united states year 2014 i brought a set of bamboo massage stick with me but i never got a chance to use it it's just in a cabinet and that time i remember Oh, my bamboo. Then I look it up. Then I try to practice it to my husband. Then he loves it. Then I practice to some of client. I ask permission if they love to try the bamboo massage. Then when I do it again and again, a lot of clients like it and they felt better and they felt release on their pain. Then I study different kind of uh, stroke to reach to how to reach the muscle then that was the start that I made the book so the bamboo massage helps therapists because they don't have to use their hands as much yes the that that there the finger the elbow because my bamboo therapeutic massage had six different sizes of bamboo so different size of muscle reach different size reach by different size of bamboo my bamboo massage stick it came from the bam, bamboo tree itself so it depends the accurate line of the bamboo that is the bamboo stick i use i never reproduce it i just got it dividedly from the tree so but there is a large diameter there is a medium diameter and there is a very small like finger uh, our our little finger there is a size like that and when you ask about the shoulder it's like the third of the smallest bamboo how does it work so i use oil then sink into the muscle by very slow movement we're thinking that the bamboo itself is an extension of our hand so it's become our hand so what our hand can do we're thinking that it's also the bamboo can do are there diagrams in this book as well yes i i do the picture and the movement of the bamboo. Is this a book for massage therapists or for everybody? It's okay for everybody because the book is not only for massage technique. It also shows their how to, like a husband and wife example, and the wife wanted to massage the husband, but they don't have enough money to go to spa to massage the husband. So the wife, even if they are not licensed, but if that is a family member, it's okay for them to use the massage. And it's not only about massage, it's also the endangerment zones of the body. It's written on the book so that they know what, what's the area you need to massage or not. And also the indication and the contraindication of the massage itself so they know if there is a sickness like this you're not allowed to massage that because it's contraindication in their body well, give me an example of a, a danger zone a zone you would avoid in the body the danger zone of the body is where all the nerves was and the softest part of the body like example on the neck there is an anterior side of the neck the one in the very front yeah and the one on the very side almost front and one on the very back almost almost on the side okay that's the endangerment zones of the body the back 
of the knee that endanger it it clarify in the book so so they they will know how, what they gonna need to do when they are in that part so that they become particular in some endangered area of the body do you do workshops on bamboo therapeutic massage for now i'm using it for class and all the persons that wanted to class with me uh, the book is available for them if i set up the tuition or that the payment for class i included the book already because i have book then i apply for national board of massage therapy nationwide the ncb tmb now i am a pro provider that's great, Felisa. Good for you. So out of that, uh, I got from sale from there right now. I think from under my care student, they bought online on Amazon. I said before you, before you set an appointment with me for a class, you have to order first your book to the Amazon and read it and set an appointment for your class to me. So that's how I do it right now. That's a great start, Felisa. Thank you. Well, this is very interesting. I, I would love to try bamboo massage on my husband. If I get mad at him, can I hit him with the bamboo? Can I like, it must hurt. Yeah, like you, can, a... you can do that. So, <laughs> it, so they're not going to be mean to us so that we have instrument now. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> how long is the bamboo stick? Oh, the bamboo stick is ranged into the my smallest one is two inches and my longest one is ten inches. It can heal body and soul. So we're we're, we're looking on a positive way to help people. But for the bad people, they can look that on a bad way, but no. We're using it on a good way. <laughs> yeah. Listen, there's nothing like a great massage. Nothing makes you feel more alive. And there, there's so many healing properties. Yeah. Of all the jobs I have in my life, the, being massage therapy is the, the love work that I ever had. In fact, I never considered a massage therapy as a job. I considered it as a duty to my client. Every Aww. time my client felt better and they said, because of me, because what I'm doing, instead of they having surgery and they don't have surgery no more, and a lot of looking onto them and never know that it's gonna happen. There's a possible that it can cure and they lost the, like example, pain, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, tennis elbow, they lost it because I massaged them. That's the inspiration out there. That's great, Felisa. Good for you. Thank you. An attorney from Brazil and mother of three, Carmen Frenji believes love is all around us and it's time we shared it. The name of her book, The Love of Crystal. To be honest, I never thought that I was going to write a book. This, which started with that in conversation with friends and the neighbors, or my I play tennis with my teammates, or even a grocery store, talking about different subjects, or about a bird, or more children. I always heard people saying, "Oh, you should write a book," but then it started happening more often. You should write a book, and I thought, "Wow, how you know tell a story." talk to people is one thing to put in a book to fill a book with a story is a different thing but if throughout these years i think is it starts sounding like a, as a message that i should write a book and then it said okay god if you want me to write a book you know you have to guide me but to write a book about what and then you know i think inspiration come i I can say that I'm a person that loves to love. I love to love. I, you know, I'm very optimistic, a passionate person. I love animals, I love children, I love the nature. <laughs> and I said, why not to write something about love? And then, you know, I said, okay, let's see, let's write 
stories about my, my life. And then everything started like that. Well, the title of your book is The Love of Crystal. Yes, exactly. Because even though it's my own stories, I created a fiction character, which is Crystal, you know, based on myself. So even though the, the, the cover looks like a children's book, because I wanted it to look like this innocence of where we were kids that we should bring this throughout our lives also. But it's not a children's book. It's for everyone. It's a book for everyone can read that. Each chapter is a story bringing a message of love. It's simple. It's simple. It's short. You know, you asked the question, what would happen if a little angel had a chance to come down to earth with a mission from heaven to spread and share more love? I think love is all around us, everyday life, you know, we just need to open our hearts and this angel came with this mission to bring love. But of course, when she becomes a human being, it's a different story, but in these stories that she lives in her, her life, love is there. We should find love, should spread love. And it's so simple to me, it's so simple because we, we are surrounded by love. If you see the blessing that we have, if you look in a children's face or in animals, or even in, in a smile of someone, love is all around us, but we need to have our heart open. And that I think what the, this angel came, became a, a human being and in her own experience, she had to find love and finding love to spread love. When she was a kid, she met uh, a poor girl that lived in a farm. She dreamed to have a toy for Christmas, but she didn't have a chance to, to, to have that. And the crystal lived in away from the city and they went there. She, they were like nine, 10 years old and she loved the crystal right away. So she told the Christmas that Christmas, Christmas was about to come and she, what she wished to have this, this toy, which was impossible at that time for her to have that. So Crystal couldn't think about any other thing. And so when she went home, she tell, told her mom that, you know, we need to do something because I know that it's not possible for them to, to afford that. So she had a new toy that she got on her birthday. And she went back to the, the farm and gave the new one that she had and toys for the other kids. And we, probably this, it is one of the stories that I never forgot because it totally changed, you know, it two kids in the same age and totally probably changing their whole life. You know, when I, Crystal became a mother, she understood how much she had to put her best effort to be a mother because how many moms they don't have a way to feed their kids, you know, right. yeah. but it's the most important thing in, 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 I think in a human's, on a women's life to be a mother. And also I have a story that, you know, I, I dream to be one thing. I wanted to be a veterinarian and ended up being a lawyer, but yes, my nature was to be a lawyer and, mm -hmm. but I didn't understand because I was too young. And um, the book explained the story, but it ended up that I understood that this was, you know, the best thing for me. So blessings in disguise. And when we find love in this little day by day in our life, you know, uh, we can count in our blessings. And the, the more I think we feel blessed because we are so blessed. When we count our blessings, we become more grateful. And I think gratitude is a magnet of more blessings. And when you feel that, you you really want to spread happiness, joy to other people. It's kind of a chain. And that's what I think it is world that we live is so complicated, but we we cannot change it, but we can change people's lives around us with a smile, with a word of you know encouragement or or anything. So that's why that's, that's my book. <laughs> I can see why people who know you were encouraging you to, to spread your message of just sheer joy. I prayed every single chapter 
I prayed to be guided to, you know, if ever I had to write a book, of course, is to send a message. Even though I found, I think, the, I can say the best publishing because the page was amazing. They are so supportive. Since the beginning, it was very easy to, to, to be with them, to, you know, everything that I needed, they, they gave me more. And when I had all this finished, my three kids put their, I have three grown up kids and they put on their Instagram, their friends. I think, Alice, that if you're supposed to, to, to write this book, it's going to happen. You know, it's, I'm very positive about that. And yes, it's going to be spread no matter what with my Instagram. That, that's what I, I have faith of. All right, Carmen, you're very and, uh, inspirational. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I think that's that's exactly what I I I, I convey to people, <laughs> yeah. not even knowing that that's what exactly. And I'm I, listen. I'm so happy to to hear you saying that, and that's exactly that is that's love. You understand that that's love when you make somebody feel good about it. That's love. So we all have this. It's just we need to put it out. Yeah. You know to express that. It's simple. Well, listen, you have a great day, Carmen. Thank you. Thank you. And I love it to be part of your, your podcast, too. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. A writer, communicator, and motivator, C.L. Black Jr. is back with his second book for Fulton entitled Ascendancy. What's your process here? You know, everyone has a, a gift, you know, whatever that is. I don't know. You know, my mine was always being able to relate to people and break things down make make things like very simple like if if i have to speak in front of someone like i don't write note cards i get like a concept and i speak around it you know if that makes sense tell a story and it's always had that kind of knack like i write a lot of poetry that i happen to think it's pretty decent i, I haven't put it out there yet but like i i've always had that knack and so through the years when i've gone through adversity i've gotten back to my poetry and gotten grounded you know for a few months it's like a purge so to speak and then um i you know i have a business i have a mortgage brokerage that i've had for 25 years so that keeps me like uh like in this bubble when it comes to being able to escape and do the things that i really want to do <laughs> like it's like 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 my my passion is writing and um that's why I put like the first uh, book out there called Fundamental Rules for Kindergarten 101. And I kind of started making up these rules because I just saw the way kind of like our society, I, I'm a Gen X, you know, so, and I, you know, I've seen a thing or two and, and, and I, I see, you know, all these things that are going on. And so I was like, you know, you know, if we could, you know, adopt these rules that we learned back in, kindergarten right <laughs> and apply them to everyday life as adults that would be a good thing you know so anyway it was kind of like a demo like everything i learned i learned in kindergarten yeah Remember that book so it kind of reminds me of yeah I, I used the kindergarten and the number four just to get back to basics but really it was kind of like 10 rules that right. i developed that i thought would be you know good for people these days and so um when i sent it over to fulton it was just one big there was no paragraphs, nothing. Cause I'm not like actually a reader. Like I don't really know how to structure things. And, and so like, I'm more of like an audio visual person. So they sent, they sent it back. Well, we like your content, but like, you know, dude, can you put this like in paragraphs? <laughs> so you know, it was really raw. And um, I just pushed it out. Cause I really wanted the constructive. I want somebody to go, man, you need to. And, and, and that's how I get driven. I, I, I know myself. So where did ascendancy come from? Um, ascendancy was uh, a term that um, I I wanted to use because you know a lot of not a lot of people understand what it actually is and you know what I mean it's it's very basic but like they you really don't hear hear, hear that term so I thought it would be I thought it would draw people in um, I've had a lot of adversity in my life so most of my works right now re revolve around not my adversity but parallels to that you know trying to explain to people how they can overcome these types of things and and ascend okay uh hence the, the term of the book but like uh uh and in doing so you preserve your sanity which is one of my other books to attain happiness and and within that you have to have 
a present day attitude, which is another one of my books, my next 24, right? So it kind of all built. It was like rules. Okay. My next 24 hours, I ha- how do I preserve my sanity to, you know, to actually be happy? And then now, how can I ascend if, if, if all these things that, that I have in place are susceptible to, to breaking down? Okay, so you write in your, sub- your synopsis, the ability to thrive in the midst of adversity and all its demons of hope that can transform into angels of grace, which is, you know, I, I think it's interesting because how many times does, does life show you when you think you're at the bottom of the lowest pit you've ever been in, that when you finally are able to pull yourself out of it, it is the result of being in that pit that brought you to the place you are. That's exactly right. So this is not a book of poetry. Is this a story? What is it just thoughts? Is it musings? Like I do an outline of, of what I'm trying to like the, the message. And then I break it down into chapters that I think are interesting. And then I, I base my writing around that chapter to tie it into the concept. So for example, um, demons, that's uh chapter two basically i wrote around these types of things that can haunt you come into your mind intrusive thoughts and how you have to overcome them you know how to kind of like take take those demons like like a like a negative into a positive everybody is kind of like a um, they have different ways they deal with 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 things And and unless you practice it um you know good thoughts in bad thoughts out um and and really it all stems from how, how much you really want to become a better version of yourself. And so you have to make it a priority. It's like a different angle for them to better themselves. Like if they can get something out of one paragraph in my book, it's an accomplishment. And then obviously the whole book is positive energy. So then, you know, maybe you can look at some other things in the book that, that, you know, may help you out. Any um, advice you have for your readers? Um, like a Facebook, I call it fake book, <laughs> you know, like people get caught up in, you know, everything going on with other people's lives. And then, you know, they feel inferior and, you know, so I, I think I, I give that as an example and, you know, I don't know why they would want to subject themselves to, you know, I think I call it mental torture uh, on a daily basis when, they're in control of their own lives. Okay. What everybody else is doing and and what they think of you is none of your business. And that's kind of how I put it. Get off social media. Oh Lord, man. (laughs) I've never seen anything like it. It's, I mean, you know, obviously it's great for like maybe communicating at, you know, old school people, you know, that you knew from the past or something like that. Like have a purpose, not like this feed, like this need you get up and you got to, you know, creep on people's pages to see what they're doing. And, oh my gosh, it's just, it's insane. And do you live up? Am I, are they doing more than me? Should I feel inadequate because I'm not doing what they're doing? Yeah, I I just, life is hard enough. And then you add to it with all this, you know, outsourced stimulus that, that really is, is fabricated. Um, They're, they're addicted. So at a cellular level, when you take that away, you know, it's one of those things. It's like, it's like a habit, um, like, like quitting drinking or smoking or whatever, when they're dependent upon that, it can get kind of ugly with their own lives. I think. Put you in a depression real quick, that freaking social media. <laughs> anyway, CL Black, it was such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Oh, you too. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. We hope to see you back here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.